Welcome to the Exploring Unschooling podcast. For countless parents, the journey to unschooling has redefined childhood and transformed their family relationships. Are you curious? Together, let's explore what living and learning looks like without school. Hello, explorers. I'm Pamela Riccia, and this is episode number 300 of the podcast. It's the 19th of October, 2021, as I record this intro. And woohoo, 300. I never imagined that when I started out. And thanks so much for the positive feedback I received from last week's first episode of this mini series to mark the occasion, sharing the draft of an as yet unpublished book I wrote a few years ago. It's lovely to know it resonated. One listener mentioned she was looking forward to sharing it with her partner, which I hadn't thought of, though. (laughs) That definitely may be helpful, since I'm starting with the basics. So last week, I shared the book's introduction, Chapter 1, What is Unschooling, and Chapter 2, Our Parenting Mindset. This week, we're diving into Chapter 3, Nurturing Curiosity. Of course, before we dive in, I want to take a moment to thank everyone who has chosen to support the podcast through Patreon. I deeply appreciate all my patrons, truly so much. Your generous support pays for the hosting and transcription and contributes to the time I spend creating new episodes like this each week. It's instrumental in keeping the podcast archive freely available to anyone who's curious and wants to explore the fascinating world of unschooling. If you'd like to join my community of patrons and scoop up some great rewards along the way, check out the Exploring Unschooling page at patreon.com. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash exploring unschooling. And now let's dive back into the book. Chapter three, Nurturing Curiosity. The next stop on our unschooling expedition is curiosity because it is the root from which learning and living blossoms. In adults, curiosity is a wonderful trait. It's that spark of desire within us to know or understand something. Curiosity motivates us to ask questions, to keep digging, to figure things out, to learn. It drives us to explore things that intrigue us, to dive into our interests and passions. When challenges arise, it inspires us to dig in and better understand the situation so we can come up with more effective solutions. And in our relationships, it spurs us to better understand the personalities and interests of our friends and family so we can connect more deeply with them. It is curiosity that drives our active engagement with the world. In his book, Curious, The Desire to Know and Why Your Future Depends on It, Ian Leslie describes the essence of curiosity this way. The most fundamental reason to choose curiosity isn't so that we can do better at school or at work. The true beauty of learning stuff, including apparently useless stuff, is that it takes us out of ourselves, reminds us that we are part of a far greater project, one that has been underway for at least as long as human beings have been talking to each other. Yet, how curious and engaged are many of the adults you know? That's one of my go-to questions when I'm trying to get to know someone better. What are you interested in? What do you do for fun? And I'm amazed at how many times the answer is some version of nothing, really. After work, I just want to go home to relax and unwind. Most often, I nod in understanding, yet my own curiosity has peaked. Why don't you find diving into something you're interested in relaxing? Why don't you consider whatever it is you do to relax and unwind an interest? It's not hard to imagine that they might find diving into something they find interesting more challenging than relaxing because they have learned to judge themselves against a conventional yardstick of accomplishment. If you're not good at something, don't waste your time at it. And getting good at something seems insurmountable. And that whatever they do to relax and unwind, say watch TV or read a book, is probably conventionally considered an escape and not worthy of being called an interest. By their own assessment, their life is small and their curiosity about the world has been worn away. How might that happen? Wired for curiosity. Human beings are wired to be curious. From their earliest days, babies and toddlers are driven to explore the world around them and figure out how it works. 
As parents, we marvel at their single-minded determination as they struggle to lift their head, to roll over, to sit. They keep going until they drop from sheer exhaustion. We delight in their accomplishments and constantly encourage them. As the saying goes, children are like sponges. Their mind is thirsty to learn. And then they learn to walk. Now their curiosity makes life messy. Cupboards emptied, food squished, puddles splashed, toys dumped. The world is new and interesting and now they're mobile. They want to help with everything from fixing things, tools, to cooking, pots, to folding laundry, warm clothes. They are drawn to participating in whatever the adults around them are doing because they are curious about their world. But as their excitement and exploration bumps up against their parents' exhaustion and wish for some peace, their days gradually become peppered with no's. No, that's not a toy. No, don't make a mess. No, don't touch that. Children continue to be insatiably curious about their world, yet now we seem determined to stop them. And when we do this, the message we're really giving our children is to stop being curious. Ignore the things in the cupboard. Don't wonder how far across the room your stuffed bear will fly. Stop dropping your spoon on the floor. Do not unravel the toilet paper roll. We justify our behavior to ourselves. I don't have time to clean that up. They could hurt themselves. But is a firm no really the only option? Because if we aren't careful, helping our children explore and learn about the world soon takes a back seat to order and convention. Life becomes less about helping them engage with the world and more about making our days easier. And it doesn't get any better as our children get older. The mess becomes a bit more focused, less whirling dervish, yet we continue to shut down their curiosity and exploration. No, you can't watch another episode, it's bedtime. No, I'm too busy. I can't drive you to insert any fun activity. No, your friends can't hang out here. They'll eat all our food. The same thing happens in school. When kids ask questions, they're often told, that's not on the test, or we'll cover that later. And once homework and extracurricular activities are done, they have precious little time left to dive into the things they are personally curious about. In fact, often they are so busy doing what's been put on their plate by others that there's little room to even wonder what they might be curious about. The pull of curiosity weakens each time they aren't given the opportunity to ask a question, to follow a thought, and to end up somewhere new. Most children ultimately get the message. Their questions, their interests, their explorations aren't important. And eventually they stop asking. Sooner or later, they even stop asking themselves. Their lives are busy with school and then work and their curiosity about the world around them fades. That's how it can happen. In her book, Big Magic, Creative Living Beyond Fear, Elizabeth Gilbert describes creative living as being driven more strongly by curiosity than by fear. Living with our minds open and curious, it's a mindset. In fact, researchers are finding that curiosity is correlated with other positive traits, such as improved learning and memory, problem solving, and creativity. So how could I help my children become curious adults who are actively engaged in enjoying their lives? I began to imagine spending my time and energy nurturing my children's curiosity rather than discouraging it. Reaching for yes. If a seemingly endless stream of no's nibbles away at our children's curiosity until it's nothing but crumbs, it stands to reason that we're looking to say yes a lot more. The beauty of saying yes is that it opens up the world for exploration rather than closing it off. And it's not just about the big yeses. All the little everyday yeses add up too. Yes, let's see what happens if you mix all the paint colors together. Yes, you can play my guitar. Yes, I'll read you the book again. Can you envision their smile in response? Not only is their curiosity rewarded rather than stifled, you are also cultivating a stronger connection with them, building a deeper relationship. Yes by yes, they will come to trust you to facilitate their needs and help them explore their world, help them learn. 
I love how Alison Gopnik describes learning in the context of parenting in her book, The Gardener and the Carpenter, what the new science of child development tells us about the relationship between parents and children. She wrote, our job as parents is not to make a particular kind of child. Instead, our job is to provide a protected space of love, safety, and stability in which children of many unpredictable kinds can flourish. Our job is not to shape our children's minds. It's to let those minds explore all the possibilities that the world allows. Our job is not to tell children how to play. It's to give them the toys and pick the toys up again after the kids are done. We can't make children learn, but we can let them learn. Yet saying yes more can become challenging if you're only doing it because you think you should. I have to nurture their curiosity. It's hard to say yes when we don't understand why this particular yes is important to this particular child. The way to discover the value that their choices hold for them is to look at the world through their eyes. I don't mean putting ourselves in their shoes and thinking about what we would do in their situation. I mean seeing the moment through their eyes and contemplating what they might be drawn to do and why. It's a fundamentally different perspective that asks us to at least acknowledge, if not remove, our own filters and try on theirs. If we aren't aware of their inner world and how it bubbles up to the surface through their curiosity, when we consider our children's wishes against our adult ones, they often fall short and we can quickly find ourselves back at, no, I'm too busy. If they love trains and you're annoyed with how much they love trains, when they ask to go to the local train station, acknowledge your perspective and then try to shift and see theirs. Feel their anticipation and excitement, not just your boredom and annoyance. That was a powerful shift for me because I began to see the wonder of the world around me again, rather than the jaded adult perspective that had slowly crept in. I realized that their world of play was as important to them as the adult world of tidiness and paying the bills was to me. That trail of toys you found that goes from the family room to the hallway to the kitchen what if you don't focus on the mess for now and examine the scene through their eyes? Look for clues to help you uncover the thread of curiosity that drove them along that particular path on this particular day. In the family room, you see clear evidence of battle. There's what appears to be a ship built out of wooden blocks. There's storage containers sitting on its side nearby. There's a crew of small figures, one perched at the end of what seems to be a plank. There's a stuffed octopus lying on the floor a foot away, probably a kraken stand-in, you realize, remembering the pirate book you read to them last night. You notice a few of those soft juggling balls on the floor, mostly gathered in the empty corner. Cannonballs? <laughs> Why are they all in the corner? In the hallway, you see plastic swords, a cardboard box filled with toys, only sparkly ones, you note, know, and a discarded eye patch you recognize from last year's Halloween costume. You recall hearing some battle cries and laughter a little while ago, and now you realize why the pirate battle over the treasure spilled out into the hallway. More floor space for their sword fight. Then you check out the kitchen where you find their toy pirate ship on the counter, a puddle underneath. So that's what was in the corner of the family room being bombarded by cannonballs. And you notice the sink is still half full of water and a variety of toys, some floating, the rest sunk to the bottom. It seems they took the battle to the water. Your first reaction may well be to feel frustrated that they didn't tidy up one room before moving on to the next. But as you shift to seeing the scene through their eyes, you imagine their joyful fun and excitement and learning. It crosses your mind that they were probably so deeply engaged in their play that they barely even noticed what room they happened to be in. Through their eyes, we can see the curiosity and drive to explore their world that inspired their activity. They were in the flow. From the imaginative time spent setting up the pirate ship battle in the family room, to playing with the physics of aiming cannonballs, to their physical engagement in a pretend sword fight, to their water play and exper experiments with buoyancy. It becomes clear that their play isn't about us at all. They aren't trying to frustrate us with messes. 
This is their important work. Now we can try to simulate this kind of learning in a more controlled environment with art, dioramas, science, buoyancy, and gym, sword fight. <laughs> but we could never recreate this flow of deep engagement in their activity. And that's where the most enjoyable and effective learning is found. What's more, these scenes would play out very differently for different children, rarely matching the sterile classroom version. That's why it's important to see the world through the eyes of your children. That's how you can uncover the deep value to them of the things they choose. It's how you can come to understand their inner world. To facilitate the shift to valuing our children's play and saying yes more, it can help to shift our parenting mindset from gatekeeper to facilitator. When we think of ourselves as a gatekeeper between our children and the world, it's easy to get stuck there. We feel protective and often let fear dictate our answers. In that mindset, no comes more easily because we're asking ourselves, what might go wrong? But by thinking of ourselves as facilitating our children's lives, we are more apt to ask ourselves, how can we make this work? Rather than filling our minds with dire predictions, this question fills it with interesting possibilities. Again, opening up the world for their exploration rather than closing it off. Your child bounces up to you and asks, can we go to the zoo? The question seems out of the blue, but you pause for a moment and remember that they've been looking at the big book of lions every day since they checked it out of the library last week which they did after you mentioned in passing conversation about Chester, your cat, that lions are big cats. Do you want to go see the lions, you ask with a smile? Yes! <laughs> sure, let's look at the calendar. Tomorrow, Jenny's coming over to play, but we can go the day after that. You write it on the calendar alongside your own appointments, giving it the same level of value and commitment. Let's go visit the lions. It's easier to say yes when we see the threads of their interests weave through their days, when we recognize that they are reaching out to make more connections. Their actions and questions no longer seem arbitrary, so much so that when they do, we realize it's probably because we have missed something. We come to appreciate that our children are not mysterious bundles of random acts and behaviors. Now, having sung the praises of saying yes more, it's also important to note that this isn't done in a vacuum. In fact, a thoughtless yes can be as det detrimental as an automatic no. Neither one is a considered act. If parents say yes over and over without considering the reality of their lives, what their children are learning is that they can expect a yes regardless of the circumstances. They come to feel entitled to a yes answer to every request, and that doesn't help them learn how to live in the world. Instead, we can take the time to genuinely listen to our children and consider the circumstances of the particular situation. Maybe a visit to the zoo isn't possible this week. Maybe it'll be two or three weeks before we can make it work. If they're upset at the delay and asking why, Instead of getting frustrated and saying, because I said so, we can explain and we can continue to talk about it in case they have another idea. We can commiserate and in the meantime, search the web for zoo cams and more pictures and information about lions. We can download the zoo map and have fun planning our trip and take another trip to the library to find more books. There is so much learning that will happen at the zoo probably about the animals themselves, maybe about navigating around the huge property by map, maybe about how useful it is to have water with you, maybe about dressing for the weather. And there is so much learning that will happen in figuring out the visit itself, considering others' schedules, taking into account the times the zoo is open, when transportation is available, and maybe budget too. Context matters to learning. Sometimes your children will be more involved in the planning process than others. There's no need to insist either way because over the years, there will be plenty of opportunities. In fact, as my children got older, they naturally tended to do most of the planning before they came to ask. I checked the calendar and we're free next Friday. Can we get the tickets to go see this band? Tickets are 10 bucks. If it's okay, I have the website up on my computer to order them. 
Saying yes more sounds simple enough, but in practice, it's not so easy. Change is hard, and in this case, it's often tightly woven in with the whole power paradigm of adults versus children. Conventionally, parents are expected to wield power and control over their children to show them who's boss. Children's needs and wishes are not expected to be considered equally alongside their parents' needs. This attitude can really put a damper on helping our children follow their curiosity because if our perspective is that meeting our children's needs is of secondary importance, we are more apt to reach for an excuse rather than follow through. But when we do the work to shift beyond the conventional parent-child dynamic, see moments through our children's eyes, and think of ourselves as their partner in exploring the world, we can often find the yes much more easily. Curiosity drives learning. In his popular TED talk, Build a School in the Cloud, Sugata Mitra shared this insight. It's not about making learning happen. It's about letting it happen. Mitra is a professor of educational technology at Newcastle University in the UK. In 1999, in a slum in Kalakaji, New Delhi, sorry if I butchered that, he conducted the first hole-in-the-wall experiment where he placed an internet-connected computer in a kiosk between his workplace and outside. The hypothesis behind the experiment was that groups of children learn on their own without any direct intervention. And that's exactly what they found. Unschooling parents have found this too. We cultivate an environment that supports our children's natural curiosity and we witness their learning blossom before our eyes. We focus on our child's curiosity, which manifests as following their interests, passions, and goals because we have learned from experience that learning surely follows. Free to follow their curiosity, the child is interested in whatever they are doing. When their mind is actively engaged, it is making observations, analyzing options, making connections, and figuring things out. In other words, learning. The challenge for teachers in school is that it's really hard to tell someone what to be curious about. They understand that children, anyone really, learn better when they're paying close attention, which is more apt to happen when they're interested in the topic at hand. But in school, curriculum dictates what the student is expected to learn. Teachers try to inspire a level of interest and engagement in their students, try to make it meaningful to them, but it's challenging because often the curriculum is out of step with the students' everyday lives. Do you remember wondering, and maybe even asking aloud, why do I need to know this? But free to follow their interests, there's a much better chance a child will understand and remember what they're learning because it's immediately useful to them in achieving whatever goal they have set for themselves. And because they're interested, they'll go back to it tomorrow and the next day and maybe even the next. They will be actively using what they learn, which means there's a good chance it will end up in long-term memory rather than studying enough to get it in short-term memory and then forgetting it soon after the test. There's a real reason for them to know what they're learning. And interestingly, in action, learning looks almost incidental because when the focus is on living, learning isn't the goal. It's what happens along the way as you move step-by-step toward your goal. Yet it's real solid learning. And in the bigger picture, what they are learning is more applicable to their lives, not just in the moment, but over the years as well. When you look back, you will likely see the threads that weave through many of your children's interests. Sure, some will have been abandoned, which is itself more solid learning about what they find interesting in the world. Yet as they transition into adulthood, it's not likely that their interests will do a 180 degree flip. That means that what they've been learning over the years is more likely to be useful in their adult lives as well. That's very different from school, where so much of their learning is forgotten and not needed again for years, if ever. One of the more popular ways to succinctly describe unschooling to people who are unfamiliar with the concept is to say, the world is our classroom. 
Everyone already understands the classroom as a place of learning. So this phrase plays on that and encourages them to take a step outside the school box. The idea is to share a glimpse that learning can happen out in the world too. Physical location is the most obvious difference, but the more we think about learning, quote, out in the wild, the more pronounced the differences become. While curriculum slices things neatly into subjects in the classroom, out in the world, so many things are connected. Let's take baseball as a quick example. There's the physics of pitching, swinging the bat, and catching a fly ball. There's the strategic thinking of when to take a walk or the most promising order for a double play. There's the math of statistics, player stats, team stats, and magic numbers. There's the history of the game through racism, integration, and the war years. Yet in school, baseball is relegated to gym class. There's the history of math, the math and physics and music, the social studies that are, that are an integral part of reading. When life is artificially sliced into subjects, the bigger picture is lost and learning suffers. Even a star student learning all these discrete subjects does not recover what was cut away, the interrelationships between topics. The beauty and intrigue of the world is much bigger than the sum of its curriculum parts. Helping our children follow their curiosity creates a wonderfully personalized path of learning that no out-of-the-box curriculum can even match. This made sense to me, but still, at first, I worried about gaps in their knowledge. What if they miss something crucial? Then I remembered that fundamental shift away from the 18-year window of childhood. When we see learning as an integral part of living, it becomes something that we do over our lifetime, rather than something that should be finished by school graduation. The idea of gaps becomes obsolete when learning doesn't have a deadline. Gaps are just things a person hasn't learned yet. With our lifelong perspective, we realize our kids can learn something whenever it comes up in their lives. We understand that the basic set of knowledge and skills that is helpful for getting along in our community are exactly the things that unschooling children will come across because that's where they spend their days. They aren't sequestered away in a school building where things need to be introduced, often artificially with the admonition that you'll need to know this one day. That one day appears naturally in the life of an unschooled child, along with the intrinsic motivation to learn otherwise known as a reason to use it. <laughs> Skills like reading and writing and numeracy are an integral part of our world, and unschooling children will find reasons that are important to them to gain fluency with them. We'll dive, into, we'll dive deeper into how that works soon. As for the worry of missing something crucial, if a particular topic or skill hasn't come up yet, obviously it wasn't crucial for them for now. If they never encounter a need or wish to know something, that lack of knowledge won't matter in their lives. If the knowledge or skill is valuable, they will encounter a need to learn and use it at some point in their lifetime. Does it matter if a person learns the ins and outs of volcanoes when they're 7 or 10 or 16 or ever? If they live near an active volcano, it will come up in conversations, probably from a young age. If not, they may see a mention in the news or in a story that sparks their curiosity and inspires them to learn more. Maybe they're interested in how the Earth's crust is formed and come across volcanoes through geology. But if they never come across volcanoes in their lifetime, it would not hamper their ability to live a fully and happy life. It can also be helpful to realize that there are certainly gaps in school kids learning as well. Not only does the curriculum not cover everything, when students graduate, they don't remember everything they learned either. Gaps are everywhere. Gaps are inevitable, especially now that as the pace of change in our lives accelerates. The skills that a person graduates with now are more likely than ever to become obsolete during their lifetime. So knowing how to learn new things is a very useful skill more useful than waiting for someone else to tell you what you need to learn and to send you to a classroom to learn it. Mitra discovered what unschooling parents have long known. It's about letting learning happen. By encouraging their children's curiosity, 
by fully supporting their engagement with the world through their interests and passions. Not only are unschooling parents nurturing an incredible amount of learning, they are cultivating the joy of learning. Learning is not separate from living. Nurturing curiosity. So how might we go about filling our children's days with this kind of inspired and engaged living? Earlier, we talked about saying yes more, how it helps our children explore their interests and discover the joy and value of being curious. This is a great way to nurture curiosity, but there's more we can do, even when they aren't specifically asking for our permission to do things. Shifting our perspective to see their lives through their eyes helps us better appreciate their wonder and fascination with the world, not to mention rediscover our own. Being open to our child's wonder means not presuming where things will go next. This is almost the opposite of a curriculum, where the next step is not only already defined, but so is the next one and the next. Being march-stepped down a predetermined path leaves little room for wonder, for exploration, for experiencing the joy of an unexpected discovery. Along those lines, nurturing their curiosity also means not jumping in with an answer or well-meaning advice if we haven't been asked. Their exploration isn't about us or how we see things in the moment. It's about them. By allowing their curiosity to unfold from one question to another, from one activity to another, we're showing them that there's value in pursuing their questions in their unique order. What they find may not always be interesting, but they won't know unless they look. Maybe things go unexpectedly and they're disappointed. Still, they've learned something. They can backtrack if need be and try another path, make another connection. By not jumping in and taking over, we give them the space to see the possibilities that lay before them. Another way of encouraging our children's exploration of the world is to show them that their questions are important by answering them. Even if it feels like the hundredth question we've answered in the last hour, that won't last forever. Even if it is messy, figuring things out often is. We show them that their process of exploration is valuable by not complaining. Why is our pile of books okay, but their pile of Lego is not? If it's really an issue, we can help them figure out another way rather than grinding their curiosity to a halt by insisting things unfold on our schedule. Giving our children the space and support to explore their interests and questions helps them discover the deep satisfaction and joy inherent in learning new things. Now, let's get more specific. How can you help your child explore an interest? Well, let's dive into that Lego pile. What if they love Lego? Most obviously, you can supply them with Lego, <laughs> not begrudgingly, but excitedly. Spend time building with them. I found myself well suited to hanging out and sorting pieces. <laughs> Spending time with them doing an activity implicitly shows your support and respect for their interest. And through observations and conversations, you begin to discover what they enjoy about it, what draws them to the activity. For example, with Lego, notice whether they more enjoy free building, i.e. making their own creations, or building pre-designed sets. If they enjoy free building, you can search out a wide variety of blocks to give them more options. Thrift stores, garage sales, and people selling their Lego collections online are a great way to fill out your child's collection. Search online for pictures of interesting things other people have built with Lego and enjoy going through them together. Notice how the things your child is attempting to build are growing more complicated over time. If there's something in particular they'd like to try, search out examples or guides online. If they prefer completing Lego sets, is there a particular kind? If not, maybe what they're enjoying is the process of following the directions to get a predefined result. You can keep an eye out for interesting sets around their skill level or a bit higher if they enjoy the extra challenge. Maybe they'd also enjoy 3D puzzles or more traditional model building. You could bring some of those home to try or check them out together online or at a store. Or if there's a particular theme to the sets they enjoy, you could help them explore that. Are they from a movie? Have they seen it? 
Are they from a particular time, say medieval castles or space travel? You can bring more of that theme into their lives beyond Lego. Toys, movies and documentaries, books and audiobooks, board games and video games, arts and crafts. There are so many ways to feed curiosity and explore an interest. And along the way, see how they react to the things you show them. Without judgment, remember this is about them, not you. You're showing them, by example, the different paths that their curiosity might take. You're helping them explore their interests more deeply. You're helping them discover the root of their interest. What is it that they love about Lego? Supporting an interest and exploring where it might take them helps them experience the joy that comes from being curious. Over time, they'll also discover that you really never know what treasures you might uncover when you first set out on a curiosity-inspired quest, and it's fun to find out. Yet another way to nurture your children's curiosity is by being curious yourself. Are you exploring your interests, asking questions, and seeking answers? If you find yourself mostly indifferent to the world around you, it's time to fan your spark of curiosity. You needn't start with an earth-shattering question or a big, passionate interest. That's way too much pressure. Just quiet things down for a while and listen. Notice what catches your attention, and rather than dismissing it, roll it around in your mind for a moment. Is it connected to something you already know? Is it something new to you? Why do you think it caught your attention? Might you enjoy knowing more? Don't judge it, even if it's something that is conventionally looked down on. In Everything Bad is Good for You, Stephen Johnson makes a great case for how popular culture has been growing more sophisticated and engaging. Even though some of his examples are starting to show their age, it was written in 2006, his analysis is solid and aligns with what unschooling parents have seen unfold with their children. The logic and reasoning skills required to figure out the unspoken rules of a video game world are applicable in any situation, not just video gameplay. The skills required to recall and analyze the complicated landscape of a long-running TV drama series are just as relevant and valuable for analyzing a real-life situation, as is the ability to synthesize all that information and share it coherently, say, in an online forum. Don't squelch your curiosity before you even see where it might take you. In this chapter, we've talked about how humans are born curious, yet conventionally, while one hand talks about the value of curiosity, the other gives day-to-day -day advice that is more likely to squash it. We talked about how saying yes more to our children's requests helps them explore their curiosity, and how using curiosity to drive their learning creates a wonderfully personalized body of learning that no out-of-the-box curriculum can match. Then we looked at ways we can nurture our children's curiosity, giving it safe passage through childhood so that it is a welcome companion throughout their lives, namely by not jumping in and directing their exploration the way we imagine it, quote, should unfold, by answering their questions without judgment, because there are no bad questions, by helping them fully explore the things they enjoy and find interesting, and by nurturing our own curiosity. I'm often asked what a typical day looks like for unschooling children, but I bet you're already getting the idea that that can be a difficult question to answer. Days can look very different for different families, even for different children in the same family. Yet, the curiosity that drives them is the same. What do they love? What questions do they ask? What would they like to try? One of the most beautiful outcomes of growing up unschooling is that our children haven't lost their curiosity about the world. They have a zest for life that I can only marvel at. I hope you found this episode helpful on your unschooling journey. And be sure to check out the growing podcast archive. The conversations never go out of date. You can find more information about my books, the Living Joyfully Network online community, and the Childhood Redefined Unschooling Summit online course at my website, livingjoyfully.ca.